This is Plant-Based Briefing, Breaking Free of the Dietary Pleasure Trap by Doug Lyle, Ph.D. at the T. Colin Campbell Center for Nutrition Studies at nutritionstudies.org. And I'm Marian Erickson, and this is the Curated Content Plant-Based Podcast, where I narrate articles on plant-based and vegan living with permission in about 10 minutes or less every weekday. And today's article is from nutritionstudies.org. Their mission is to promote optimal nutrition through science-based education, advocacy, and research. They were established to extend the impact of Dr. Campbell's life-changing research findings. He's the co-author of the best-selling book, The China Study, Poll, The Low-Carb Fraud, and The Future of Nutrition. He's also featured in a number of the Whole Food Plant-Based documentaries, including Forks Over Knives, Eating You Alive, Food Matters, and Plant Pure Nation. And Doug Lyle, the author of this article today, is also co-author of The Pleasure Trap, which is another great book that I recommend as well. So now let's get to today's plant-based briefing. Breaking Free of the Dietary Pleasure Trap by Doug Lyle, Ph.D. at NutritionStudies.org If you're holding a copy of Health Science Magazine and know what it's all about, then you're one of the lucky ones. Of the 300 million people who live in our country, most will spend their whole lives confused about what's good for them and what isn't. If you're one of the fortunate few who has a good feel for the truth about health, then you're more than halfway there. The problem is, knowing is only about half the battle. The other half of the journey is pretty tough. Just knowing doesn't quite get it done all by itself. For some reason, even after we know just what to do, there's a tendency to go ahead and do self-destructive things anyway. If we listen to a pop psychology show, we might hear all sorts of dark and complex speculation about why people are often self-destructive, but doubt any of it is right. We think there are reasons for self-destructive behavior that make perfect sense. The Strange Behavior of Moths in the Night Have you ever taken a few moments to stare at moths banging into your porch light? Why do they keep circling and flying into a dangerous light? And more chilling still, why do they sometimes fly right into a candle or hot light that zaps them dead? It seems incredibly stupid, so why do they do it? Maybe moths are mysteriously self-destructive for some deep, dark, and complex reasons. But we doubt it. We think there must be another reason, and one that makes perfect sense. There is. Why they do what they do. Moths, it turns out, are designed to fly towards light— They have built within them a natural compulsion to fly toward it. The reason is that in the ancient natural world, the only lights around were the moon and the stars against the dark night sky, and flying toward these lights was useful. The moon and stars are at optical infinity. You can never get there, so they're effectively stationary objects in the sky at any moment in time. This makes them very useful as points of reference for the internal compasses of moths, who can make great use of the fixed light. By flying toward the light, a moth can get above the present fray and take a peek around for food and mates. Then, after an enticing foray is complete, the moth can return to its original position by reversing the angles in its head and following the reverse path home, using celestial objects as a guide. So now we can see where the mistakes are being made. When moths are flying toward human-manufactured lights, they do so because artificial lights fool their internal compasses. If the light is safely encased in glass, the moth simply backs away in confusion upon bumping the glass, then circles around and flies toward the light again, and again, and again. Its internal compass is great, but it fails this time. It's never supposed to reach the light, and by doing so, it's all messed up. And if the light is a hot candle or light, the moth might even die. It isn't suicide, it's a contrived accident. The Right Question If we ask the question, what is it about moths that makes them self-destructive, we would be asking the wrong question. Our question, as framed above, innocently leaps to the conclusion that moths are self-destructive. Of course, it looks like they are, but when we ask the right question and answer it, the mystery disappears. The right question is, why do moths fly toward light? Once we know, we can put away all talk about tendencies in moths. Why good eating habits are such a challenge. This health thing is hard, no doubt about it. In the 25 years that we've dedicated to helping others get on track or back on track, we've witnessed this mighty struggle. Why is it hard? We now see that we better ask the right question before we try to answer it. We think the question is, 
Why do people prefer foods with artificially high calorie density to healthier, low calorie density foods? When framed this way, the question has a sensible answer. People evolved in environmental circumstances where calories were scarce. This we know as it was true all over the world just a hundred years ago, and it is even still true in many places. Calories have always been in short supply, or at least very often in human history. So nature made sure that we came equipped with taste preference machinery built into us, like an internal compass, to make sure we take advantage of any high-calorie opportunities. Scientific studies conducted over the last decade have concluded that our brains release greater concentrations of pleasure chemicals, dopamine and natural opiates, when the food we eat is of greater caloric density. This should be no surprise. There must be a reason that we like a ripe apple better than a tart one, and there is. When you eat a ripe apple, your calorie detection equipment knows that there's a good caloric concentration there and says, good, keep eating. A tart apple, maybe 10% less caloric, is discarded. One apple might be 77 calories, the other merely 70. That 7-calorie difference is detectable, and your taste preferences let you know it. A white-hot light. A chocolate apple, though, would be about 770 calories, at the same size. That's because chocolate is about 10 times more caloric than fruit. Talk about a white-hot light. The same tendency is there in all modern processed foods. Chips are about 8 times as caloric as fruit, bread and hot dogs are about 6 times as calorie dense, and, like moths to the light, we are all drawn to this caloric density like iron filings to a big magnet. We need to resist. For our health and well-being, we must. Breaking free. Breaking free from the dietary pleasure trap or any addiction can be very difficult. For those individuals who find the challenge overwhelming, a residential approach that may include an intense program of education and a period of supervised water-only fasting has often proven to be extremely helpful. You just listened to Breaking Free of the Dietary Pleasure Trap by Doug Lyle, PhD at NutritionStudies.org. And I'm Marian Erickson, your host. And one thing I like about the concept of the dietary pleasure trap is that there is a biological reason that we're drawn to these highly processed, calorie-dense foods. There's nothing wrong with us. We're doing what we're designed to do. If you're interested in more on this topic, check out the book, The Pleasure Trap, written by Doug Lyle and his colleague, Alan Goldhammer. And I heard Alan Goldhammer on a podcast. I think it was the Rich Roll podcast. I heard him talking about nuts. And in nature, you know, years ago, It would take a long time to open a nut and eat it. So people wouldn't go crazy eating handfuls and handfuls and handfuls like we can do easily now because nuts are already opened for us. We just stick our hand in the bag in the jar and consume way more than would be natural for us to consume. If you Google the dietary pleasure trap, you'll also find all kinds of YouTube videos with either Doug Lyle or Alan Goldhammer talking. Lots of great information. If you're interested in more information on calorie density, check out episodes 168 and 455. And a number of previous episodes talk about how our taste buds can change with a whole food plant-based reset, like 21 days of eating whole food plant-based, low sugar, oil, and salt can really affect and help us reset our bodies and break free from that dietary pleasure trap. And water-only fasting, like Dr. Lyle mentioned, is also a very well-proven method If you're interested in more information on that, you can check out episode 221. I'll link that in the show notes as well. So please share this episode with anyone who might benefit, and thanks for listening.